Another batch of 10 out of the remaining 21 abducted students of the Bethel Baptist High School, Damishi Kaduna, has been released by the bandits after 81 days in captivity. Chairman of the Kaduna State Chapter of the Christian Association of Nigeria, CAN, Reverend Joseph Hayeb, said that 10 students were released on Sunday afternoon and were reunited with their parents. This is as a former Senate leader, Senator Ali Ndume, at the weekend, condemned in strongest terms the recent killings of some Nigerian soldiers by Boko Haram insurgents in Mate Dekwa local council area of Borinu State. However, while giving an update on the Bethel students' kidnap debacle, Hyatt expressed hope that the remaining 11 students will soon be released. Tundu. I mean, when? this new tranche of released students must come as a huge relief to the students, their parents, and all of us in general. Mm. But it just is so tragic that this is where we are as a country. Mm. And according to news reports, the bandits have made 200 million naira mm. just from this battle hall mm. alone. So this is a billion naira business that mm. these bandits have been undertaking. And the, the, the government continues to sort of pussyfoot on this issue. This is so tragic that mm. students cannot go to school. This, this, this is terror. This is terrorism, mm -hmm. frankly. Mm -hmm. 200 million naira, and there's no chance of prevailing on their better nature, as has mm. been posited in some quarters. They don't have a better nature to no. prevail upon. They're all about money. And I really fear for the 11 remaining students. And my only hope now is that the ransom being demanded, because if those parents could have met the ransom, they would have met it by mm. now. I'm sure there's no parents standing on any ideological belief of, I will not negotiate with, mm. with terrorists. If they could, they would. The fact that they have not been able to release the last 11, I just pray that somehow the bandits can, you know, arrive at some kind of understanding with those people who negotiate with them and talk to them mm. and just release these children, just release all of them in their custody. It's too much. You know, the Daily Trust has it on the front cover every day. The number yes. of students in captivity is staggering. We should not be here as a country. But the sad reality is we're here, Doctor. Yes. Well, I thought... Uh March uh, 2021, we were told that uh, over 700 students have been kidnapped alone between December 2020 and March 2021 in states of the northern parts of Nigeria. That in itself is a frightening figure. Now, on uh, July 5, when 121 students of this Bethel Secondary School along the, uh, uh, you know, Kaduna Expressway were abducted, mm. that was the 10th case of major kidnapping school involving school children in mm. the northern part of Nigeria. Now, in this particular case, either you're talking about the Greenfield University case or similar mm. cases that we had uh, in different parts of the north, parents have always had to pay ransom mm. because government has made it very clear that it will neither negotiate with bandits or pay ransom to them. So the people who bear the brunt are the parents themselves and also the children who go through a lot of trauma, go through a lot of frustration, and whose parents have to go and look for money uh, to pay to these bandits who have created some kind of ecosystem, mm. some kind of entrepreneurial you know, uh, uh, business uh, environment mm. around the kidnapping of human beings. Nobody at all should be subjected to that. Mm. But a long-term issue that we have to worry about is the implications for education mm. in northern Nigeria. We're told that, uh, you know, over 10 million Nigerian children are out of school. But, you know, the bulk of that, uh, you know, uh, uh, figure uh, you, you will find in the northern part of the country mm. where education remains a major problem, poverty remains a major problem. And then you add this spate of kidnappings to it, and what you'll find, you know, is persons in that part of the country particularly being exposed to uh, great uh, jeopardy. Now, what should government do about this? Well, I think government has a responsibility to continue to ensure safety. We have a safe school initiative in this country, which has been there uh, for almost close to a decade now. Mm. Now, what progress have we made? There have been uh, observations that the challenge with many of these schools in the north is perimeter fencing. How many schools, you know, have, been, have we been able to put fences around since all of these uh, incidents you know, began to uh, escalate. The long-term thing, of course, is that 
Boko Haram will seem uh, to be uh, gaining an advantage mm. when they target schools, apart from the business side, side of it. When schools are targeted, you are also discouraging people from sending their children to school, mm. particularly in a part of the country where education has been a challenge, you know, over the decades. So why should anybody expose his or her child uh, to danger? So the long-term effect of it is to make sure that Boko Haram does not succeed. Boko Haram says West Western education is a sin. And as many schools as are shut down, in fact, at a point, uh, in states of the north, over 600 schools were shut down for mm. a long period of time. Now, if students have to stay at home or they lose, you know, an academic year, uh, even when they go back to school, they will be studying in an environment of fear and anxiety, mm. and that in itself may affect their concentration. I hope that this, uh, you know, additional 10 students that have been uh, released, that counseling, even if government will not pay a ransom, maybe counseling services will be provided for mm. them and their parents. Mm. And hopefully uh, the remaining 11 students will also be uh, released. Uh, you know, well, we, what do we say? We congratulate the parents that their children have been able to return home safe and I hope in healthy conditions. Mm. Yeah, we just have to congratulate them. What are the chances them. of that though? Hopefully physical yeah. health, but 81 mm -hmm. days in a forest? The, the, the trauma, in fact. Oh my gosh. You know, when, when students set out to go to school in this country, they didn't think for once that they will have a day where their parents will be congratulated for their trauma. I know. I mean, that's the country we have become. And the shocking thing is when we speak out loud, you see, we don't criticize to bring anybody in power down. We criticize because there are niggling challenges that are niggling our education sector, like this insecurity. And we need to speak up. We give counsel, we speak up to draw attention, to ensure that things are done properly. This is bad. The question is, how can we stem this once and for all? Because this must not happen again. This doesn't happen. This shouldn't have ever happened in the same place in the first place. But on the flip side of it, I'll give kudos to the military. I hear they're pounding out this bandit, this terrorist, daredevil, kamikaze-like terrorist. You know, I hope the military is successful, but this must never happen again. Well, we have no guarantees on that. <laughs> but the security agencies should just make sure the environment is safe for all. Yeah. That's all on News Headline. We'll take a short break now. When we return, we'll have Rotus, Michael, Adesua and Nero Nakirjala to give updates on Africa, global business, COVID-19, spots and activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Morning Show here on Arise News. Now for business updates, Michael Wilson joins us from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, first of all, um, globally, concerns about the contagion effects from Evergrande are actually affecting the markets uh, right now, as are the supply chain blockages, particularly affecting fuel supply to four courts in the UK. I'll give you a lot of detail about that, that in a moment, but let's just get uh, a global view, particularly as the Federal Reserve and Bank of England are uh, increasingly hawkish, really, about the rise in interest rates. So just looking at what happened um, in the markets uh, in Asia-Pacific, uh, China's Evergrande and all that crisis and so on hit st their own stocks uh, in Hong Kong, shares in Asia Pacific fairly mixed. They have come back very, very slightly, um, down about 10% uh, the Evergrande shares. Um, again, no indication as to whether they've paid those foreign bonds uh, or not. Um, in, in Japan, the Nikkei little change, the topic index, so mixed really as far as Asia is concerned, but those Evergrande things uh, completely uh, underlying the market and underlying market sentiments at the moment. China said it's applied to join the Trans-Pacific Trade Pact, the, uh, the, um, the CPTPP. Uh, it, it did apparently a couple of months ago. There's considerable doubt as to whether it'll actually be allowed to join though because of the, the problems in China. Um, and China and Hong Kong uh, based Bitcoin uh, holders are scrambling to protect their crypto assets. Um, China said on Saturday, uh, Friday into Saturday, that uh, crypto bitcoins would be illegal, as would also cryptocurrencies. As far as the United States is concerned, Dow futures jumped a little. It is towards the end of the month. It was a very, very mixed week. You've got Evergrande, you've got supply crisis and all the rest of it underneath that. And the House of Representatives has pushed back um, their vote on the 1.2 trillion infrastructure uh, vote. Um, they want the bill tied to the 3.5 uh, trillion Build Back America Better 
uh, situation there. So that's that's going down to the wire. And you have this proposed shutdown of the White House and federal things towards the end of the month. Um, the Australian Prime Minister has ruled out um, uh, phasing out fossil fuels uh, because the country depends so much on it. And finally, as far as the rest of the world, I'm going to come on to the crisis in the UK, uh, the, the EU, the German uh, elections, the centre-left has won narrowly against uh, Merkel's party and uh, really business is waiting to find out whether or not the actual shape of German business can continue. OK, so as far as the UK is concerned, then there's panic at the pumps. There has been for a couple of days. The worst possible thing, of course, has happened is that politicians uh, have come out with, you know, saying don't panic and also newspaper headlines like the alliter alliteration of panic at the pumps. And so that's been a lot of the headlines. The truth of the matter is that there is no shortage of supply, as a shortage of oil itself, fuel itself. It's just a question of the shortage of HGV drivers. A hundred thousand, I was telling you last week, um, the government's trying to... Um, Try, trying to get over that by uh, widening visa requirements to attract drivers from Europe. Whether or not HGV drivers will actually want to come to the UK, of course, is another matter. As far as the figures are concerned, two thirds of 5,000 independent um, retailers are out of fuel right now uh, across the UK. There are 8,000 uh, petrol forecourts in total. Um, these are the independent ones. Again, there's plenty of fuel around. It's just not getting there because of a shortage of lorry drivers and so on. Um, the government is promising 50,000. As I said, there is this gap of 100,000. So things are looking very, very serious. And this morning, um, the news is that uh, they're going to actually, they're, they're going to cut competition rules so that supermarkets, suppliers and all the rest of them can actually swap notes as to where to deliver um, best that's last used during the food shortage or the shortage on shelves at least, not a food shortage, but shortage on shelves um, during the, 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 the pandemic. So that's the UK. Oil itself rallies in Asia. Uh, oil prices finished last week um, on a firm note. Um, OPEC struggling to, to get to production, whether we're going to get more news from them don't know at the moment and gold is just lingering in limbo that's the global view so right. shortage here okay michael let's talk about shortage in the uk uh is this brexit trying to you know turn things for the uk as regards the economy and shortages because we know that most british people will not do this work you know to get out there and be drivers you still have people coming in from continental europe to come and do this work and now the new visa policy are these effects of Brexit. And secondly, why didn't the Prime Minister think about things like this? I mean, there's something called scenario planning. And somebody would have thought that the almighty UK will have had the scenario planning and iterated various scenarios for an eventuality like this at some point. Because it's not only oil, it's with gas. It's the, there's an energy crisis in the UK. Yeah, there is there is an energy crisis in the UK. Um, you blame a bit of it on Brexit, but mainly uh, it's due to people actually not wanting to be HGV drivers. You're absolutely right. There's a high retirement uh, from the industry. It's not a very pleasant job, basically. Uh, hygiene is a problem. You know, it's not like it is on the continent where there are there are special places for lorry drivers and so on, special parking places for lorry drivers. Some lorry drivers in the UK are having to find fifty pounds to park a night, uh, and of course they they can claim that back in expenses but they don't get it straight away. And if you're not earning a great deal of money, then you're not getting that back. And uh, the most important thing is because of security problems, because of basic hygiene problems and so on, women are not being attracted to the work either. So there is a big shortage. Wages are actually quite a long way down in the reasons for people quitting uh, the, the business. As far as um, preparing for all eventualities is concerned, I don't think any country does that. Not making excuses just doesn't happen. But the whole world is dependent on short time delivery, quick time delivery. And, and th this is what everything's structured around. So when you get something like this, which is actually quite fundamental and hitting supply chains, this is what happens. Yeah. And we have an energy crisis as well. That's slightly different. That's to do with the strangled hold that Russia has on gas and so on, and, and the rise in gas prices and the rise in energy prices. 
crisis. So it, it's all looking again. I don't like this winter of discontent thing because I think it's it's too pat and it's too it's too headliney. But I think there are certain big big problems which needed to be sorted out. Politicians can only do so much. I'm hoping that business actually will be a lot more adept at trying to solve some of them, particularly with supply chains and drivers and so on. But that's where the central that's where the central point is. It's an industry which is going into people not wanting to work in it. It's a bit to do with Brexit, but it's a lot to do with the industry itself. Yes, because there are um, lorry driver shortages in Europe as well, so it can't all be about Brexit. And with regards to planning, there was a plan in place in case of a no-deal Brexit to roll out the army, so the army might take charge, as we might see today or tomorrow. But my question for you is that do you agree with the British Chamber of Commerce who say that this plan for 5,000 emergency visas for um, the lorry drivers to be turfed out on Christmas Eve, which seems a bit cold, but do you agree that it's like throwing a thimble of water onto a bonfire, which is how they've described it? I, I, I saw the quote on a Saturday. Everybody's searching around for good quotes out there about, about the crisis. I think it will only help a little. I mean, the actual industry is saying that even 50,000 drivers, see, they're, they're not going to start straight away. They're going to have to undergo tests and so on. Bringing in the army is a temporary solution. God bless them. But they don't, they don't necessarily want to have the skills to continue with that and fill the gaps until the HGV drivers come. I think it'll take a lot of cooperation between the big oil companies and the big fuel supply companies, which is what the government's pressing towards. But you're absolutely right. Talk about being caught with one's pants down is exactly what's happened here. Well, but clearly, I mean, uh, the UK faces a winter of discontent with this uh, energy crisis. But the surprising thing was that the Prime Minister's attention was drawn to this possibility in June. And you know, between June and now, uh, what Kwasi Kwarteng, uh, the business secretary was saying, was that there was no, uh, you know, no, no shortage of anything. And also, uh, Grand Sharps, the uh, transport secretary, has been quoted as saying there's no shortage of fuel. We just need people uh, to be sensible. And that is why there may well be here, you know, uh, a failure of leadership at one level. I don't know whether you agree. Because before now, you know, this concern about the AGV uh, drivers, the uh, manufacturers, the transporters, they have been asking for temporary visa waivers. And now, months later, uh, we're back to that same point uh, in the UK. And obviously, they say there will be a, a shortage of Turkey in, at Christmas. And even Operation Escalade, which is a plan to call in uh, the army, is going to take up to about a week uh, for that to, to, to happen before the soldiers can be re redeployed. That's one. The second point has to do with uh, China's uh, Evergrande. Uh, Evergrande could not pay its offshore bond holders on Thursday, the $83.5 uh, million. This week, uh, Evergrande is required again to pay about $47.3 uh, million dollars, uh, you know, interest payment uh, to again uh, uh, some of its uh, bondholders. If it failed last week, there is no guarantee uh, that it will succeed this week. So China clearly with Evergrande faces a credit crunch, or is there any other option? And what does the crisis with Evergrande, what does it mean for the rest of the world? What people are hoping is that the, the crisis at Evergrande is going to be contained within China itself. How they deal with that, maybe it's a debt for equity swap and so on. They're not going to issue shares in the company. They've already said that. It is an enormous problem for them. Just to get it absolutely correct, so they were supposed to pay $83 million worth of bond payments on Thursday. No word about that. And that's 43 this week as well. However... There is a waiver period of 30 days, which they, they seem to be they seem to be intent on um, on on uh, on availing themselves of at the moment. But it's no question uh, you could actually get mo most of a, a small European country into the empty uh, apartments that Evergrande has built in this in this sort of property bubble. I think it's going to be a systemic failure as far as China's concerned. It's got to do something about that. Whether the rest of the world would be caught in the contagion, don't know about that yet because we had HSBC and. The other banks saying that they wouldn't necessarily be caught, but in, in a sense, they would say that anyway. I feel as though the markets, if you take what they're actually saying this morning, is no, the, 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 the contagion uh, is, is not going to happen directly. I have my doubts about that. I think when something as big as Evergrande fails, I think people tend to look at each other and, 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 and rush, rush for the exit in the same way that I was reporting earlier that cryptocurrency holders are doing the same, given that. It was just noticed that China has now suddenly made it illegal, according to websites. As far as political failure is concerned, yes, I think that um, 
since the since the, the the success of the vaccine rollout the government's really been on the back foot they have not realized how difficult it is to get out of a pandemic how to restore supply chains with or without hgv drivers and certainly the general increase in energy prices which is affecting everybody around the world is 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 building up to to this to this perfect storm um, that, that we're now facing i think though when politicians as i said right at the beginning of all this start to say to the public don't panic the public says i think we will and they do and that's what's happening at the petrol pump. There is no shortage of fuel. There's a shortage of supply getting it to the pumps. That's the message. Right. I think that's probably true. Well, I must say, though, that uh, what is going on in uh, England now looks familiar to us in Nigeria here. And the average Nigerian has special skills in terms of, uh, you know, panic buying of fuel, carrying jerry cans to store fuel, and, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, methods. But, you know, black market. <laughs> we never thought this will happen in the UK, but it's good to see that uh, it's not only in Nigeria that we have a uh, fuel queues. Michael, I could hook you up with some fuel in Jerrican black market if you want. <laughs> well, we don't want to see punch ups in the forecourt. And don't panic is about as effective as calm down. It just doesn't work. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilson, for your time this morning. We'll take a short break now and we'll be back with more business updates. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show here at Arise News. Our dependable Rotus Sodiri is here to give us an African business update. Over to you, Rotus. Hey, good morning, Tunu. Good morning, Fry. Good morning, uh, Doctor. Doctor, I watched you in Anambra State. A great, <laughs> great uh, moderation of that uh, uh, nice. panel discussion there with all the aspirants uh, looking to take over Anambra. Um, the e Naira, that's uh, what we're discussing. Front page of uh, today's uh, This Day uh, newspaper. E Naira, actually, the, it's, it's, uh, the website has gone live a week ahead of the launch. And um, the, the October debut has actually been rescheduled to October the 4th. Uh, it was supposed to be on October the 1st. But with all the festivities uh, planned around um, the October 1st uh, Independence Day celebrations, didn't want to take away from, from take away the shine from that. So they've rescheduled it to October 4th. But the site, according to uh, this day, um, uh, reports of the analytics about a million hits is what the uh, the site has uh, has received. Again, this of course is supposed to support wallet transactions, peer to peer transactions between individuals, movement of uh, the naira from bank accounts into the wallet. Um, the the APIs, the application processing interface uh, for the website, uh, has received also received a lot of hits. This underlying tech is supposed to be the launch pad for a lot of collaborations going forward in terms of uh, payments, uh, in terms of reducing costs of uh, transactions, in terms of reducing cash holdings. So you know, it's there. There it is. I mean, that's the, the website is up. The, the the central bank has again has been working on this for what, two, three, four years uh, in, ad in, ad in advance of, of this launch. Other countries across the world are doing this. The United States is looking at Jerome Powell, just at the uh, close of the FOMC meeting, Federal Open Market Committee meeting just last week, Powell said the United States is still looking at a digital currency. So they're not even there yet. So ooh, Nigeria is ahead of them. The U Europe is looking at it. China is already testing their digital yuan. So again, this is something that central banks around the world are moving in, in this is the direction they're moving in. China cracked down again on cryptocurrencies last week, saying that every single one of them is, is illegal. So, you know, if you look at where the way central banks around the world are positioning themselves, including Nigeria, you know, digital currencies are the way to go. And I'm, I'm very excited to try it out, to at least see how facilitating the wallets, which central bank has a wallet first, but then over time that's going to transition to the commercial banks that will have their own wallets to where whoever you bank with will be able to provide you with a wallet through which you can move your transactions uh, back and forth. So again, the digital side of this, uh, reducing transaction costs. Uh, also, in fact, there is, it, I was looking at some analytics from around the world. Most of the hits came from Nigeria, of course, but they're also, if you look at the, 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 the geographical location of where the hits came from, the United States was also there, Europe. So there is interest around the world in this digital currency. So again, it's been rescheduled October 4th, but you know, we'll, we'll see how things uh, work out there once, once it takes off. But again, lots of interest in that uh, digital currency. Um, we have to trade policy. Also, um, uh, this the newspaper you know, is looking, well, was investigating a new trade document we're expecting from uh, the Minister of Trade uh, and Investment, uh, Nia Adibayo. Um, they haven't found any yet. I mean, he promised that there would be an updated trade document coming forward. Um, if you think about the impact of trade and what it means for FX inflows, I think first quarter of 2021, 
we imported about, I think it was about 6.8 trillion naira worth of goods. Going out was about uh, 2.9 or 2.8 or so. So there's a trade deficit over 3 trillion naira. And if you think about, uh, you know, appetite for imports and the weight it puts on uh, our currency, we have, we've talked about this several times. You have to, you know, export more finished goods in order to be able to bring in more um, FX inflows into the currency. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to see that, you know, this day, the newspaper folks at this day are investigating this and putting some pressure on this ministry in order to put a revamped trade document forward because, you know, look, I, I last week I, I said um, he, was in, he was in New York, uh, the Minister of Trade and Investment was in New York talking to journalists and, and other folks saying that there's a promise of about $10 billion in investments headed towards Nigeria, and he's working on turning those promises into reality. I was talking to someone, who, an analyst who said, Lagos alone can swallow $10 billion like that. It only takes a few projects. We need more, you know? So um, as far as the focus on, the, on that particular ministry, with respect to FX inflows, foreign direct investment, the strength of the currency, more focus does have to be placed on these other ministries that are responsible for trying to improve our trade balance and also uh, strengthen uh, the currency. And then uh, finally, over in Kenya, uh, uh, ABSA Bank is uh, partnering with uh, Melanin Capital to support um, more female-focused entrepreneurs in, the, in East Africa's largest economy. Um, they are looking at providing them with about to 3 million shillings worth of unsecured loans. Yeah, I mean, this is something across the African continent. You're seeing a lot of private sector folks trying to get as much funding as possible uh, to, to entrepreneurs. So, you know, again, nothing new there, but yeah. more the merrier. I, I think they have been learning from us because I think banks like uh, Nigeria, some banks in Nigeria have that, like I think Axe yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, they've got something like that. But real quickly, I want to talk about the ENAR. I'm yeah. really excited. I'm bullish. I can't wait for the technology to start. Uh, you know, I know it'll have a couple of sitting problems, just like yeah, early, early days, days, early days. Early yeah. days will have yeah. a sitting problem, but I think it will work. Yeah. And... I, I'm looking at the impact of what it will have on e-commerce, for instance. Oh, yes. You know, how it's going to boost e-commerce trade and the likes. You know, how it's going to diversify payments. Facilitate faster about, payments, yeah. You know, facilitate faster payments. And that's what technology does. And, and this is regulated by the CBN. Everybody should embrace it. You know, this is the time oh, yeah. for it. And, and we're here. We're excited. We're ecstatic. We just want to see how it pans out. Mm. And, you know, as long as they get the technology right. And then they should get it right. You know, right, I'm bullish will. about them. You know why? Because... Over the years, give it to NIPS. NIPS has done a good job as regards, you know, interbank settlements and the likes. And Indeed. Those transactions. Yep. And NIPS has done a you know, stellar job. So I think they should get it right. About the trade policy, long overdue, we can't keep having trade deficit year in, year out. And that's why we even need to rejig what we import. Mm. We should look at critically having more machinery come in so we can use it to produce goods that are finished and export. Because, you see, when you look at the analysis about knowledge-driven economy. What they do is they export goods that is based on knowledge and research that yield high amount of money. We keep talking about Malaysia and oil palm. Right. Malaysia didn't get rich for exporting oil palm. We don't say that part of the narrative. Malaysia got rich by exporting things like television sets, you know, electronics and the likes. Mm. So those were intellectual goods, not the oil palm itself that they are one of the biggest producers of. We need to rejig that. I foresee a day where Nigeria will start exporting television sets, game consoles, and things like that. I talked about PlayStation. Yeah, yeah, you did. 39 billion. You did. Just from one product. Very interesting point here. Real quick, you talked about the need to import uh, machinery. The CMD CEO of First Cardiology was on Newsday on Friday. And he talked about one of the biggest challenges that the medical sector in Nigeria is facing is the import of machinery into the country. Why? Customs. And he, he's, I mean, it was a very, I urge all our viewers to go and check on our, our YouTube page, uh, our Rise TV on, on YouTube and watch that interview. These are some of the things that, you know, as in order to facilitate trade, the ease of getting these machineries into the country is also very important. Well, very quickly, I think the uh, digital currency, uh, it's a very good development, quite innovative, bootstrap taken by the Central Bank of Nigeria. In fact, previously on this program, I had pointed out that we got to that point even before China. Yes. Nigeria announced its own digital currency program uh, before China did. And that for me was exciting. I think I commented mm. on it here. However, there's still a lot uh, that the Central Bank needs to do in terms of public education. There are persons who have raised questions. Okay, what we're calling 
the e naira is it going to be a legal tender or it will be a legal document uh, like the check like credit cards and okay if it is uh, will it be compulsory for merchants uh, to use that uh, what are the other options available so these are some of the questions that the public will need to know and if you look at the demographics, well, I'm relying on what you are showing mm. uh, on, That's the on the screen. That's on the website. Yeah, these are from, yes, the, website. from the website. Yeah. The you see website. that, yeah. you know, the persons that uh, joined that, uh, you know, uh, site within 24 hours, uh, about one million hits, yeah. you, you said. Yeah. You know, if you look at them, most of them fall within a certain demographic. Mm. So to make it uh, more acceptable to the people, uh, to draw more people to it, mm. I think that public education is also important. Otherwise... Oh, yes. Uh, it will just be uh, people, you know, young people uh, who are interested in technology. As for uh, trade policy, well, is the problem really revamping of trade policy or the way our economy is organized mm. and the misalignment between monetary policy and fiscal policy that we have had within the system? You know, the tendency in government is to come up with a new document uh, to say we're changing this, we're changing that. But if there is no political will, the document, the trade policy document prepared under uh, Minister Ganga, uh, you know, at, at, at the time, you know, was probably the most comprehensive that Nigeria has had. But what have we done right. with that document? So the problem is not about ideas. Mm. It's about the will and the capacity to translate those ideas into action for the benefit, overall benefit of the economy and the people of Nigeria. Well, regarding the e-naira, like you said, there's a lot of sensitization that needs to happen. There need to be champions for it. And like you also mentioned, the teething problems shouldn't actually be much of a discouragement because you'll recall when ATM started yeah, right. and all the issues there. And mm -hmm. today it's completely indispensable. We can't imagine life without it. Right. So I think that's really great news. And at least there's one thing we can boast of as Nigeria then, 61, because I'm actually trying to think of really what have we achieved. So at least we have that. That's good. And yes, a trade policy. Yes, you're right. A lot of our policies are usually not even worth the paper they're printed on, are they? They're just not. But we are somewhat rudderless, aren't we? We do need to chart some kind of a path. We do need to really shore up our forex you know problems that we're having and there has to be some kind of market access it does have to be codified i feel Indeed. so it, it is sort of worth the effort that's going to be made i do hope sooner rather than later Indeed. Very much one so. major thing many nigerians would like to know when we begin to embrace this digital currency what are the risks involved mm -hmm. and how is the cbn thinking ahead to mitigate the impact of likely risks mm -hmm. right that is important mm -hmm. i think very well, much so. I think, thank you very much, uh, Rutus. We'll take a short break here on The Morning Show. We'll be right back. Stay with us. All right, welcome back. For updates on uh, COVID-19 pandemic around but COVID nineteen pandemic around the world, this one, Morwa Joseph, right now. This one, great to have you. Good morning. Hi, this Good one. morning, Rafai. Good morning to you. And welcome back. Dr. Abati. Thank you very much. Okay, I guess it's good to see you. Well, the COVID-19 has infected more than 231 million people globally and killed 4.7 million individuals. A vast majority of those infected do recover from this disease. However, some continue to experience symptoms week or even months after. Um, and this is otherwise known as long COVID. Now, scientists are studying how the virus does lung damage to internal organs, not just to the lungs, as we initially thought. They're examining the heart and other internal organs. Uh, we'll keep an eye to see what that research by scientists in Oxford uh, truly says. Here in Nigeria, the Center for Disease Country Control, beg pardon, has reported a total of 20, 255 new cases and four deaths from five states and the federal capital territory. The agency says Imo State in the southeast part of Nigeria uh, is reporting a backlog of 124 cases between the 20th and 26th of September. There are 72 new cases. 
No state reported just one infection for the day. Uh, vaccination against COVID-19 continues in Nigeria. Here are the latest figures. 4.68 million of the targeted population vaccinated so far, while 1.7 million of eligible persons have been fully vaccinated after receiving two doses of any of the available vaccines in the country. Nigeria is currently administering AstraZeneca and Moderna vaccines. It also has doses of uh, the single dose Johnson & Johnson vaccine purchased by the federal government through the African Union and the AVAT team. Now, governor of Lagos State, still in Nigeria, the epicenter of the pandemic in Nigeria, Um, Baba Jide Sonwolu, during the global live event yesterday, called on world leaders to work towards equitable COVID-19 vaccine distribution to people everywhere, especially in the world's uh, poorest countries. The governor said at the current rate of vaccination, it will take three years to reach herd immunity in Lagos, Nigeria's commercial capital. He says currently only 1.2% of the population of the state are vaccinated. Uh, he's again reiterating the readiness of the state to partner with the private sector uh, to procure, store, distribute, and administer vaccines across the state under the guidance of the federal and state government laws. According to him, the target is to vaccinate 30% of Lagos residents within the next year. And last time we spoke, uh, Tundra and Rufai were expecting President Mohamed Buhari to speak to world leaders at the United Nations General Assembly, Onga, on Friday. Well, he spoke on a wide range of issues, but he started his speech with the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, praising the global concerted effort so far. He told world leaders that his administration's efforts uh, back home to stem the tide of the pandemic has been rewarded with moderate success. He also uh, appreciated the international community's efforts so far. He singled out some of those countries. He mentioned the United States, Turkey, India, China, and the EU. However, he says more needs to be done urgently with distribution of the life-saving vaccines. Uh, I don't know, you have a guest who's come to speak on uh, the aftermath of that speech to dissect what exactly the president said. But so far, this is what he said on COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Meanwhile, uh, the British High Commission in Abuja yesterday announced that the United Kingdom is collaborating with the national, Nigerian National Primary Health Healthcare Development Agency, the NPHCD, that's the agency responsible for vaccination in Nigeria. Uh, they said they are collaborating towards recognizing Nigeria vaccine certificates. Uh, it's revealed in a statement issued on the new travel rules that take effect from October 4. Uh, he, uh, and let me just take a quotation from that spe uh, statement released yesterday. It says, following pilot with the US and European Union, the UK is working to recognize certificates from other countries as part of a phased review of many COVID-19 vaccine certificates issued, uh, issued across the world. At the moment, uh, <coughs> Nigeria is Nigerians traveling to the UK still need to quarantine for seven days, even though they have been fully vaccinated in the country. Uh, we spoke about this last week as well. But finally, let me tell you that in New York, in the US, Governor Kathy Hochul is considering employing the National Guard and out-of-state medical workers to fill hospital staffing shortages with tens of thousands of workers possibly losing their jobs for not meeting a Monday deadline for mandated COVID-19 vaccination. We're looking at some roughly 70,000 healthcare workers in New York uh, being fired for not meeting that deadline today. Well, you know, in uh, New York, uh, uh, the uh, COVID mandate was uh, announced on August 16 by former Governor Andrew Cuomo mm -hmm. with a deadline of uh, September 27, which is today. And it's on the basis of that that uh, Cuomo's successor, Kathy Hochul, uh, is now saying that health workers, about 72,000 of them, 16% of the 40, 40, 450,000 health workers that they have in the state of New York who, are not, who have not been vaccinated as of today uh, may lose their jobs. And the options she has put on the table is to recruit you know, so, uh, soldiers, National Guard, you know, uh, that have a uh, uh, background in uh, medical, one area of medicine or the other, you know, who can provide care or to recruit people from out of state. Now, so that leaves about 72,000 persons vulnerable. And all of this is in response 
uh, to the spread of the uh, Delta variant uh, in uh, New York and other parts of the United States. Despite the fact that in the state of New York, about 84% full vaccination have been achieved. But of course, the 72,000 who have refused to get vaccinated probably pose a threat to the rest of the community. But where the challenge is has to do with people who claim that they will not take the vaccine on religious grounds. Already, uh, there will be a case that will come up for hearing again, uh, second hearing at the Court of Appeal uh, uh, in New York, in the state of New York, when some teachers refuse to take the uh, uh, vaccine on the grounds that it's against their religious belief. So even if the state goes ahead and sacks these uh, health workers who are not vaccinated, the major challenge uh, that the government will face in New York will be that you could have uh, a pile of litigations, you know, by persons who insist on their rights uh, to, uh, you know, not, not take the uh, vaccine. Now, as for President uh, Mohamed Buhari, I think the president struck all the uh, right notes uh, uh, in his uh, United Nations General Assembly address, uh, particularly with regard to uh, COVID. And he used the opportunity uh, to talk about the efforts that Nigeria has made so far uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that the population gets uh, vaccinated. And of course, he expressed gratitude appropriately to all those international donors who have supported us and also particularly the COVAS uh, initiative, uh, which Nigeria supports. No, Tuno wanted to say something. Uh, well, yes, I just wanted to talk about how I'm not so sure that we're acting in concert in the world, as the president said, because I'm looking at statistics. In Europe, 51% has been fully vaccinated. North America, 46%. I could go on, but we don't have time. Africa, 4%. So there really is a lot of work to be done. Yeah, and uh, just about 1% of uh, the population in many countries in Africa has been uh, vaccinated.